Today we're back with Iron Harvest, the alternate history World War 1 steampunk mech strategy game, released to eh, okay reviews. While it was a technically competent, visually impressive game, Iron Harvest, in a lot of people's minds, mine included, was lacking in the mechanics department, and overly priced. I loved Iron Harvest's visuals and sound design, the presentation was absolutely the best part about it. The campaigns were fleshed out with cutscenes and full voice acting, and the graphical competency, particularly the game's lumbering mechanical behemoths, were near perfect. But the gameplay and content outside of the campaign was clearly lacking. A small selection of maps, extremely limited base building, an announced co-op mode that was nowhere to be seen, and a laundry list of missing mechanics that games like Company of Heroes had had for years. The way I see it, the game launched too early, rolling out of the gate lacking features and content people expected. And it seems the developers had an inkling of that too, as they were very quick to get monthly roadmaps out right after release. Nine months have now passed, and after deploying a bunch of patches, hotfixes and updates, King Art Games have rolled out the first big paid DLC release for Iron Harvest, Operation Eagle. In my original review, the issues I had with Iron Harvest could be lumped into three categories. Mechanical depth, gameplay flow, and value. So, with Operation Eagle, and nine months worth of updates, had these issues been solved, or at least alleviated? There is, of course, only one way to find out. So let's start with the state of the core game, nine months later. Since release, Iron Harvest has been receiving fairly frequent updates adding new content, rebalancing units, and fixing issues. It was telling that immediately after launch, roadmaps were being unveiled showing exciting new features like autocast abilities and a ping system. Ugh. It definitely gave off the vibe that the game was, at least to some extent, released too early. But even small things like that do indeed add up, to a point now where the game is significantly different in quite a few ways. And beginning with new features, mechanics and content, the list is fairly extensive. Firstly, maps. On launch there were only 6 to choose from, now there's 16, all ranging from 2 to 6 players. Co-op for all the game's campaigns is now available. The Missing at Launch Codex is now in the game, albeit not as rich with lore as I was hoping for. There's a new skirmish game mode in the form of Drop Zone, new challenge maps and defensive structures, a few new hero abilities, further mech versus building action and destruction, and other things I'm sure I'm forgetting. And while all that stuff is great, more important is how different the game feels to play now. I can't point to any one specific thing, but thanks to a slew of balance changes, reworks, plus a few particular new features, Iron Harvest now plays far slower in the early game than it did on release. This was one of my main issues I had when I reviewed it, as it often turned skirmish matches into a game of who can rush infantry and snowball your opponent the fastest. Now, especially in the early game, things are a lot slower to get going. Units cost more, have more longevity, and thanks to the addition of more defensive structures and a rework to the reserve system, it's much harder for one player to blow past the other early on. It leads to more player agency, something Iron Harvest has desperately needed. You can still choose to rush early, but you're not basically required to do it in PvP anymore. And if you do choose to go that route, the risks associated with doing so have been significantly increased. All told, Iron Harvest has changed quite a lot, the new features expand gameplay options and opportunities, and the flow has been tuned to a point that I'm personally quite a big fan of, which is great, as I kind of hated it as it was on release. However, my main issue with the game still stands, mechanical depth. No work has been done to bring it even within throwing distance of Company of Heroes, the series Iron Harvest takes the majority of its inspiration from. Mech vs mech combat is still one dimensional, with no damage states, upgrade trees or modifications to speak of. Mechs can't have pieces disabled or shot off, just like at launch. You're either dead or you're not dead. There's no such thing as sort of dead. Here, let me show you. While everything new helps to keep the game more interesting than before, the inherent lack of depth still leads to games feeling a bit too samey, a bit too fast, especially when compared to its contemporaries. But maybe, just maybe, Operation Eagle can help to fix that. Operation Eagle is a standalone expansion that brings a brand new faction in the form of Usonia, America, along with an associated campaign, new aerial units, maps, and more. It retails for 15 US dollars, and multiplayer is compatible with anyone who owns either just this, 
or the base game, or both, making Operation Eagle now the cheapest way to get into Iron Harvest. A marked improvement of the current $50 price tag of the base game. As for the quality of the DLC itself, for the most part it's great, and to explain why, we'll start with the campaign. Spread out across seven missions, the story follows William Mason, a young Usonian commander who, after being introduced through the opening missions, is thrust into the conflict of Arabia, as its local people attempt to overthrow the ruling powers of Saxony, and reclaim their independence. I won't get into details here as to not spoil it, but you'll meet a host of characters along the way, ranging from interesting to, eh, kinda boring, to be honest. Look, the characters aren't a selling point, and to be frank, the narrative isn't going to win any awards. But it's definitely not bad, and as far as RTS campaigns go, especially in current year, it's certainly nothing to sneeze at. Personally, I had a good time, and I did prefer it to the campaigns in the original game. There are a few twists and turns along the way, and it's interesting enough to enable some interesting cutscenes, exchanges, and perhaps more importantly, unique mission design. Of course, the usual suspects are here. Build a base and wipe out the enemy, take a few named characters from one end of the map to the other, etc. But there's some more unique stuff here too, like capturing a train, then infiltrating an enemy stronghold with just a couple of heroes, or having to fight or sneak your way through enemy territory with only a select number of units. Throughout my 10 hour or so playtime, I encountered only one real bug where a capture point bugged out and I had to restart the mission. Annoying, but not a big deal. And the only major complaint I have is that in some of the missions, if you lose too many troops early on, you'll have no way to regain them later, sometimes leaving the final standoff to be nigh impossible forcing you to basically restart, or go to a much earlier save to try again. Finally, and somewhat curiously, while Operation Eagle is able to be purchased and played on its own, the campaign does continue from the previous ones in Iron Harvest, so in a perfect world, you would play those original ones before Usonia's. Not that everything won't make any sense if you haven't, but there'll be some characters and story points that the game expects you to know, which you may not. So in saying that, I suspect that the majority of people buying the standalone version are primarily interested in skirmish and multiplayer, so this probably isn't a big deal. As a faction, Usonia stands as the most interesting of the game's now four options, thanks to the addition of aerial units. Usonia brings three unique ones to complement their four land-based mechs, each providing unique functions to support their forces. There's a light missile boat, a drone carrier, and Admiral Mason's flagship, a colossal battleship capable of annihilating foes with bottom-mounted flamethrowers and massive rotating cannons. While Usonia's aerial arsenal is pretty dope, I do have a gripe about air units in general. In Operation Eagle's marketing, it was said that the game's existing factions would receive air units of their own, adding to their existing roster of mechs and infantry. So you can imagine how disappointed I was to discover that those units would be generic ones, shared across all of the game's factions. Just how the existing shared units like machine and anti-tank guns had been previously. Now, lore-wise, I do understand why Usonia has much more advanced airships. However, I was hoping that Rusviet, Saxony, and Plania would have their own unique units, perhaps ones that were clearly technologically inferior to the ones on display by the Usonians. What we've got feels like a cop-out and a bit of a bait and switch, to be honest. I'd love to see this rectified sometime in the future. Moving on, the Usonian ground complement isn't anything to sneeze at, despite their airships taking most of the limelight. They field some distinct and powerful units, like a stealth artillery tank that's great for hit and run attacks, and this melee behemoth, which is also complemented by a side mounted flamethrower for countering infantry. Presentation wise, the devs have knocked it out of the park yet again. I'm repeating myself here from my original review, but the 3D models and special effects shown here are truly some of the best I've ever seen. The mechs look fantastic, and the level of detail down to every last moving cog and piece of machinery is astounding. I especially love the animation work, like how their anti-infantry mech just lumbers around, or how Admiral Mason's battleship moves its cannons into firing position. Everything really is incredible, and it makes me so upset that Iron Harbor still lacks any sort of mech-on-mech -mech combat or destruction. Interesting gameplay implications aside, Imagine just how visually impressive it would look to see even some of these lumbering machines tearing each other to shreds, ripping pieces off one another one by one, as their very human pilots inside do everything they can to keep themselves alive. Instead, we just get this. The occupants, apparently not that phased about being on the brink of death, content to just stand there and shoot until one of them explodes. Warhammer 2 really has set the bar in terms of big units duking it out one on one and I'd really, really love to see something like that here. 
So, with all that being said, does Operation Eagle do enough to fix some of my main problems with Iron Harvest? Well, yes, but also no. The mechanical depth overall is basically unchanged. Games like Company of Heroes still offer way more options and are much more flexible and dynamic. I will give some credit though, there are some more unique abilities and units in the DLC that do add some level of complexity, but it's solely relegated to the new faction. Previous ones are basically unchanged. However, in other ways, it's certainly improved. Price is a big one. You can now get into the game with a much less imposing $15 investment. Of course, you won't have access to any of the original game's content, but if you enjoy yourself, you can pick that up after the fact. And Operation Eagle obviously inherits all the benefits I mentioned earlier from the game's months of patches, updates, and balance tweaks. So overall, I'm really happy with Operation Eagle. It brings a unique faction with a pretty decent single player campaign, and offers excellent value for those looking to make their first steps into the world of Iron Harvest. And the developers have continued to show that they're some of the best in the business in terms of presentation. Whether you're a new player interested in Iron Harvest, or an existing player looking to expand your arsenal or spend some time in a hearty single player experience, I would recommend Operation Eagle to you. And to King Art Games, I've been impressed with your commitment to the game post launch, and I'm excited to see where you take the series next. Whether that's with new DLCs expanding on the deep lore of the world of 1920+, or a sequel, I just hope you continue to listen to the community, and if a second game is on the cards, please consider expanding the game mechanically. Iron Harvest can be great fun, but it can still suffer from becoming too repetitive, too stale, and frankly, too boring, too quickly. Especially outside of the campaigns. But it continues to look fantastic, and if that third pillar can be nailed, you'll have something truly special on your hands. Something I'd love to wholeheartedly recommend to anyone looking for a great action strategy game. Thanks very much for watching. If you're still playing Iron Harvest post-launch, what are your thoughts on the game now? And did you buy the DLC? Let me know in the comments. And if you like what I do here, consider supporting me via Patreon or YouTube memberships, like these lovely folk here. You can join Chocolate Shake, Crispy Robo Chicken, Tea Edits, Christopher Jacobson, Dakayo, Jeremy Elgood, and Standby for Systems Nominal. Big thanks to you by the way for being in the Paladin tier. I think I had you wrong in the last video, so I apologize for that. One of the tier benefits is being able to have questions answered at the end here, so I've got two. Standby for Systems Nominal asks, if you were to get a cat again, which I will, which Command & Conquer General's Zero Hour General would you name them after? Fantastic question. I mean, it's got to be Ace, right? Or maybe Dr. Thrax, but probably Ace. And Jeremy Elgood asks, is there anything from this year's E3 that has you excited? I think the main one for me is probably Starfield. I've been playing Bethesda's RPGs for years, and I'm always going to be excited for a new one. And of course, seeing that release will mean The Elder Scrolls 6 is just a little closer. So probably Starfield, and then maybe Jurassic World Evolution 2? I really liked the first one, and the new biomes and stuff for this look pretty sweet, so I'm keen for that too. Thanks very much for the questions guys, appreciate the support. And if you're looking for updates on the channel and future videos, then follow me on Twitter. Thanks again very much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.